my scripture here. Psalms 101 and verse 3. Should be starting to get familiar to you. Psalms 101 and 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Powerful. That's a very personal scripture there. Right? You notice how he keeps saying, I, and it will not cleave to me. He makes that scripture personal right there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love and your mercy, your goodness. Thank you for keeping your hands upon us and watching over us. And Lord, we pray that the Comforter will come right now. Let the Comforter speak to our hearts, Lord. Help us to glean and to receive from your word today. Let the Spirit move with liberty. Open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. We do not want to be blind, Lord. We want to see. We do not want to walk in darkness, Lord, but in your marvelous light. Open the way before us, Lord, and show us the way that we should go. We lift you up and we praise the mighty name of God. Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Praise God. All right. Come on, slides. There we go. Now, we have been talking on this theme, guarding the gate. And I mentioned ways that we can harden the target, make it harder for the enemy to get at us as we're trying to perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's what we're doing. We're perfecting. Anybody perfect yet? I'm not perfect. Just forgiven. I haven't yet arrived. So we're perfecting holiness. Well, guess what? You have an adversary. And he's coming against you, and he wants to drag you back. You've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. Amen? I believe that. I believe you have been delivered. You have been rescued. You have been redeemed. You have been brought out. How do we guard the gate? The enemy wants to get into our mind, is what we've talked about. And uh, Last week we talked about his methods We're not ignorant of his devices, his methods that he uses. And we looked at that word methodos. And the odos is the word that we have for odometer, speedometer. And it's the word for road. So it's the road map into your mind. The devil, his methods that he's going to use. He's going to come against your mind. Devil, you can't have my mind. That's what you've got to tell him. Devil, you can't have my mind. Right? So how do we guard our mind? How do we guard the gate into our mind? We talked about Bible study. We talked about prayer. Uh, last week we talked about the helmet. Remember he's, he's beating on your head, coming against your head, trying to hit you. You have to put on your helmet. Right? So today I'm going to talk about making a covenant with your eyes. Right? Remember he said here, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes, right? So you're making a covenant with your eyes. So now what I want to do is we're going to go back for a minute into our book. This this study, I'm basing it on John Bunyan's, and of course he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. This was his second most popular book. It's called The Holy War. And remember, the enemy is coming against the city, man's soul, right? So he's Basically, the backstory on John Bunyan is he's arrested for preaching without a license. The Church of England didn't like it. And so now he wants to continue to write stories, but he can't call these people out by name, right? So he has to use allegories, and he uses different things to describe. But we all know what he's talking about. 
man's soul. So the city is man's soul. Now, as the story opens in his book, Holy War, he introduces us to Satan and all of his devils are getting together and they're sitting around and they're talking about how are we going to get into man's soul. There's these big walls that are all around the city and we cannot penetrate through these walls. The gates of hell cannot prevail against these walls. So we have to try to find a way in to get into man's soul. So they're coming up with four different schemes to try to attack the city. One, they think all of the wicked hordes should attack the city or they should send, they're discussing, should they all go as once and try to swarm the city and attack it as a giant mass or should they just try to send a single soldier to sneak in and maybe open the gate for them. Two, whether or not they should go as they are, where they would be easily recognizable to the citizens as intruders, or should they go in disguise? Whether or not to show their real intentions at the start of why they have come into the city or to assault the city with words and ways of deceit. That sounds like something the devil would do, huh? He's going to use disguise. He's going to try to deceive and whether they should determine which of the citizens was the most prominent and influential and destroy them before attacking. So these are the things the devil's talking about as he's planning his attack on man's soul. And remember, the apostle told us that we should resist the devil and he will flee from us. What do you have to do right before that? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you read that pattern, a lot of people read the second part. Resist the devil. Hey, you can't resist the devil on your own, in your flesh. But if you will submit yourself to God, put on the armor of light, right, so that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, right? So as the story goes, the council made a decision we will use subtly and deceit. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version so you don't have to read the whole book, but I'm kind of giving you the... Now, if you want to read it, it's a, it's, it is an interesting uh, read. It's just when he writes, keep in mind, he's writing hundreds of years ago, so the words are kind of, you have to really kind of read it to see what he's saying, but you can understand what he's saying. So Diabolus, which we know is the devil, he's going to go in as a dragon, but he's going to disguise himself in the role of a serpent. And so what they want to do is they want to, first off, they want to try to destroy the most powerful fighter in the city of Mansoul. He's a man known as Mr. Resistance, right? Resist the devil, right? So the leader of the city is a man named Mr. Resistance. So we have to take resistance out first, and then we'll be able to get into the city. So he has such a godly influence over all the people that are living there. And of course, if you look in Revelations 20 and 1, it tells us, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. You know what I've always liked about that scripture? I saw Anne angel one angel comes and he has a chain and says your time's up for now Satan I'm fixing to lock you down God has an innumerable host of angels that surround him but he only needs to send one angel to deal with Satan he lays hold on the dragon grabbed him and laid hold on him I want you to notice this. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Is that four different people? Four different persons? People get all hung up on persons. Is it four different persons or is that a detailed description of the one person? the different attributes of the one person. We know this is Satan, but he's clarifying it for you. Yes, he's the dragon. He's that old serpent. He's also known as the devil and Satan. 
It's not four different people. So you can see that that's just how they wrote in Bible times. It doesn't mean there's four different people. Cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So one angel is able to grab him up and bind him in a chain and throw him into a pit. That's a powerful scripture right there. Devil, you're a liar. You're a loser. <laughs> I read the end of the book. You're going to be in a pit. And we're going to narrowly look upon you and consider and go, is this the one? He was making everyone tremble. Him? We're going to see him for what he is. He loves to put on this false front. He's like a, uh, he transforms himself into an angel of light and makes himself into things that he's not. So Diabolus, in the form of a serpent, he gets up close to the gates. And what he's focused on is the eye and the ear gate. The eye and the ear gate. And he sets up his ambush. The eye and the ear gate are described by Bunyan as the place of perspection. Now, like I said, that's old English. If we put it in today's writing, we would say perspective, perception, mindset, attitude aspects, viewpoints, how we look at the world, how we see the world. Okay? That's what the eye is. Have you ever heard the term rose-colored glasses? If you have a pair of rose-colored glasses on, what does everything look like? It's rosy. You're looking through rose-colored glasses, right? Have you ever heard the term blinded by rage? What does that term mean? It means you can become literally so angry that you see one thing. To the exclusion of everything else going on around you, you become so angry that you just look at that one thing and you don't care about anything else. You're blinded by rage. Rage has gotten a hold of you and it blinds you to everything else. Okay, so that's the eye gate and the ear gate. Look at that town right there. Isn't that amazing? Walking up those dusty streets. Yes, looks like an old western town, doesn't it? Anybody ever been to Tombstone, Arizona? We have some Arizona people here. Yay! It is interesting to, to see how they lived back then, and they're walking on the boards. You can hear them going, I don't know. As you're walking down the planks, of course, you walk on the street, and it's like dirt street. It's a little different now. It's modern now, but <laughs> back in the Western days, I'm sure when it rained, if it ever rains, does it ever rain in Arizona? Yeah, yeah. I think they have three days of rain out of the whole year, maybe. But, but there's what it looks like in the back. That's what the devil's like. He gives you a false front, right? He'll come and show you all this. It looks all exciting and fascinating and interesting. Woohoo! It's the Marlboro Man on his horse with his blue denim jacket riding in the high country with a Marlboro cigarette in his mouth. They don't show you the end of the Marlboro Man, do they? What happened to him? That's what the devil does. He loves to give you this false narrative this false front is what they call it. that's a false front city there you can see it from the up in the air but you can just see the this what it looks like in the back of it you can see those are shells it's only to the front so you can see the front but in the back of it there's nothing there it's just holding it up it's scaffolding so they can that's a movie set you see the the wood in the back holding it up but if you had your camera held at just the right angle and you were looking just at the front of that building, it would look like there's a big building sitting there. That's what the devil does. He's all smoke and mirrors. He tries to show you how great it is living away from Jesus. But we know he's a liar. He deceives the Lord knows that in the day that you eat that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like a God. What was he selling? He was selling Eve. 
this big, exciting, but in reality, what was it? Death. It was death. The Lord said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. But that's not what he told them. He was making them look, making it look all exciting and fascinating. That's what the devil does. The ear gate is the place where the entire town would gather to hear any information that would be applicable for them for the direction of life. And so what Bunyan is hinting at here in the Holy War is what we see and hear has a huge amount of influence as to how we think. So you have to guard. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Little hands eyes, what you're looking at. Really, the Holy War is like a wake-up call. It's like a trumpet saying, hey, you need to be aware there's an enemy who's trying to get into your mind. And if he's going to get into your mind, he's going to come in through your eyes and through what you hear. Praise God. The gates of the eyes have to be protected from the assault of Diabolus. The image and the majority of our perception about life are taken in through the eyes. Luke 11 and 34, Jesus said, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when the eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. If you look at that in the Amplified, it says, Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye... And he calls it here in the Amplified, your conscience is sound and fulfilling its office. Your whole body is full of light. So you have to be careful what you set in front of your eyes. Because a lot of times when when these things, just these images, these things just keep coming into our eyes, the things that we're hearing. You know, I have determined a long time ago, I don't care anything about peer pressure. What would happen to Noah if he cared about peer pressure? Would you rather be one of the eight people in the ark or one of the millions who caved into peer pressure and got washed away in the flood? I think it's so very important to hold to God's truth no matter what the world does. You can take this whole world, but give me my Jesus. I don't want to drift to the left hand or to the right, but I want to follow the Lord with my heart. That has to be our determination. Your eye has to be focused upon God. And so what happened in the Holy War is Satan, Diabolus, gets up close to the city and he just starts talking to them. And so the people come and they start peeking, trying to see what's going on. And Mr. Resistance comes out from behind his position of cover. And when he does, a fiery dart takes out Mr. Resistance. And with resistance gone, the devil is able to penetrate into the city of man's soul because man no longer had resistance to the devil. That's in the Holy War. Now, it has a happy ending. The, the city is recaptured and glory to God. You could be restored Amen, that's what he's saying. But the battlefield is your mind. That's where the devil's going. He wants to get into your mind. He wants to battle you. He wants to bring depression and doubt and discouragement. He wants you to look around at everything going on in this world, and he wants you to just give up. But you know what? He is a liar. We don't have to give up. We are more than conquerors. We have royal blood, just like the triple crown. Right? The horse that had the messed up foot, but he had the blood of champions running through his veins. And they said, how can that horse win? He just kept right on running because he had the blood. Right? We have the blood. The royal blood of Jesus. We can overcome anything that the enemy throws at us. Our eyes have the great ability to color our opinion, shape our perception, and cause us to make decisions that affect the direction of our soul. 
I am determined that I am not going to give my eyes over to the enemy. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I will make a covenant with my eyes. The only thing I'm going to put in before my eyes, in front of my eyes, are good things. That's what we have to say. When the enemy comes in and he starts trying to lead you astray, holding up some kind of shiny object to get your attention, you need to say, No way, devil. Mm -mm. Nope, not interested. If it appeals to our eyes in a pleasing way, we are generally sold on the product, whether it is authentic or not. I believe the devil is still very much active in our world today. Do you believe that? Do you believe we're in the middle of a spiritual warfare with spiritual wickedness? Just wickedness in high places. They want to take our eyes and lead us down a path of self-deception. But we have to make up our minds that we will not leave away from this book right here. We're going to take this book right here and we're going to hide it in our hearts. I don't care if all the other preachers get in their pulpits all across this city and refuse to preach truth. We are going to buy the truth and sell it not. We are going to hold true to God's word. I love my King James Bible. Amen? Praise God. The eyes can work towards a false view of sin, create imaginations that are not godly, and bring about a sense of perspective that is totally humanistic. You can allow your eyes to just drift away from the things of God. Or you can say, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes, and I am going to turn my eyes upon Jesus. I'm going to stay focused on Him. I'm going to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I am pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. I refuse to turn back. I refuse to give up. I will not be defeated. I will not quit. That has to be your perspective. The enemy wants to come in and tell you, Oh, hey, God's changing. Things that preachers used to preach against, you don't need to preach against that anymore. Well, I'll never forget a few years back, they had one big name, big name preacher. And they were asking him about some different topics. We're going to talk to you about some of the big things going on in the world today. And he just said, I, I, I stop. I don't like to talk about anything divisive. Just gets people upset. We don't want to talk about any of these big issues that are going on in the world because, you know, because I have thousands of people that come to my church and I don't want to make them angry. And if I say something, some of them might not like it and they might actually leave. So I have to be very careful what I say because I want to tickle their ears and make them feel good about themselves. Hell is hot. Heaven is pure. God will never change. Is that all right? So I am not going to allow myself to look at the world through rose-colored glasses. When I see things going on in the world, I am going to say, Lord, give me wisdom to see it for what it is. We have to see. I don't want to be spiritually blind. The enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to blind your mind. He wants to blind your mind so that you can't see what's going on around you. Jesus warned in this passage from Luke 11 that an evil eye can put the whole man in darkness. So if your eye is evil and pretty soon you began to see the whole world through evil eyes, 
you begin a process of self-deception. And I found a couple of interesting scriptures here. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. You know, they just had a, uh, I was just, when I was studying this morning, there was one town, I, I, I should have wrote it down, but they, the whole town just rose up and said, no, you don't need to teach all these weird pronouns to kindergartners. The people in the town finally just had enough and went to the school board and told them, no. These are five-year-old kids and they're teaching them, I want to identify myself as it. Then they had the teacher that got fired because you have to lie to the parents when they come here on parents' night. Steve has been calling himself Shirley in class. And you call him Shirley when he's in class. But when the parents come, be sure and call him Steve. You're asking me to lie? If you don't lie, you're fired. We can't use you. Uh, uh, they paid. <laughs> It was called wrongful termination, and she filed a case. And thank goodness that there is an honest judge somewhere. There's one or two of them somewhere that hold their oath seriously. You know, every judge in this country, they, they, it says in the Constitution, they are sworn in. Judges are sworn in. And you know what they swear? I will uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Right? All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs, weigheth the spirit. And if you look at it in the Amplified, it said all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirits, the thoughts, and the intents of the heart. And so, you ever notice how it's easy to be hard on someone for the same thing that we do. We almost want to justify it when we did it. Y'all have never had that problem, have you? But, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that sounds pretty bad. But you know what? I did it. it that was different. <laughs> you know. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. No, what you need to say is, Lord, I don't want to put on a pair of rose-colored glasses and only see everything is being clean. What I want to do, Lord, is be clean in your sight. Create in me a clean heart, Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. I want to be right in your eyes, God. That's what's important. Not my own eyes. I want to be right in your eyes. When the blind lead the blind, that's what Jesus said, when the blind lead the blind, both fall in the ditch. And like I said, I'm seeing right now in this world, I, it's just been the past few weeks have just been shocking to me, some of the peer pressure. The peer, absolute peer pressure, is, there's no other way you can describe it. It's the crowd, the herd mentality. Just the peer pressure. You know, I believe that Satan will work through people as they go about their daily lives. And they share their beliefs, morals, or lack thereof. And their way of life with others. And like I said, I, I do not care the way the masses go. I don't care anything about peer pressure. I want to try to do my best to live according to this book. That's it. I want to be honest in the sight of all men. I'm trying my best to walk according to his word. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Can it be said any better than that? That came from the wisest man that ever lived. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Satan... He wants to influence our thoughts. He wants to play spiritual or moral mind games and affect the way that we reason between right and wrong. And what I think he's doing is he's blinding us. He's blinding our minds. And we can become so fixated on certain things that we are blind to everything else that's going on. 
Satan will use influences that predominate public behavior, cultural practices, and beliefs while knowing most of us follow the crowd and want to fit in. I tell you, I, I just am never going to get used to men playing in women's sports. Not going to happen. Right? I'm just, I can't see it. There's so many people that can't tell you the difference between a man and a woman. I, I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you the medical definition to distinguish the difference. Did they not have the Supreme? I played you the tape. Did they not have the Supreme Court? She's on the Supreme Court right now. She got voted in. She is a woman. And the man asked her, can you define a woman? I'm not a doctor. My next question would have been, are you a woman? He didn't ask her that, but that's what I was thinking. Ask her if she's a woman. And she's sitting on our highest court right now making decisions and she can't even tell you what a woman is so it's the acceptance of social norm regardless of its immoral applications and so what it is people want to get along as they say go along to get along and that's what the enemy that's how he wants to get into your soul he wants to affect the way that you view the world he wants to Get you to a place where you can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong. He doesn't want you to take a stand. Amen. Hey, this ain't grab the chandelier and swing from it. This is just good old-fashioned guard the gates. You've got to make up your mind what you believe, and you're going to do right no matter what the rest of the world does. He's trying to get into your eyes and affect what you're seeing and affect the way that you view the world. And I say, no. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 speaks of blindness, but it has nothing to do with the eyes. I'm going to read the scripture for you here in a second. But it's blindness of the mind. If you asked anyone on the street what it, to describe what it means to be blind, of course, what would they say? Right? I can't see. I'm blind. Right? <clears throat> But notice in 2 Corinthians 4 and 3, Paul is talking here. He says, But of our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded. Notice, not the eyes. He blinds the minds. They can see it. They're looking right at it. They're looking right at it, but they can't see it. How can that be? Because they get so twisted in their views, that they look right at the truth. It's right in front of them, and they just can't see it. Their, uh, their minds are blinded. Paul comes along and describes the state of a man that has a blind mind. And there's some people you go, you need to get baptized in Jesus' name. Right here, it says, Acts 2.38, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's interesting. No, no, I mean, it says it right there. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it does say that. You believe the Bible, right? Well, yeah. Well, right there it says be baptized. <laughs> they're looking right at it. But they're going to stay with their titles. The mind is blinded. So it's a spiritual blindness you know so like Paul said in one place he said blindness in part is happened to Israel blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in right that's in Romans 11 now what is he saying they're not completely blind there's some Jews that see it some Jews see Jesus and recognize him I mean Paul saw him and recognized him but there are some that just couldn't see him, couldn't recognize him. A spiritual evil can engulf them, and this is the worst kind of evil. Because what happens is, when the spiritual evil comes into their lives, they can't see it for what it is. You know, until they get to the place where they want to change. Until they get to a place where they see the need to change. Have you ever heard the saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still? 
There are some people you present the truth to them and you show it right to them and it's right in front of their eyes and they just can't see it. Their eyes are not blind. Their mind is blind. A blind of mind, a blinded mind, is the heaviest of all judgments to have to contend with. It's almost as if the voice of the conscience has been entirely silenced and can no longer warn someone. Amen. They can no longer warn someone of the dangers that are there. Now that's what the Lord wants to do in His Word. He's warning us, showing us the right way. And when we can't see it, it's as if our mind is blinded to it. We have to say, Lord, I want to listen to my conscience. I want you to speak to my conscience, Lord. You know you have that little small, still voice that speaks to you and says, Hey, it's time to get back closer to God. That small, still voice that says, What are you doing here? God is talking to you and he's trying to draw you back to a closer walk with him. And what the enemy wants to do is he just wants to close your mind to God's word. But if you'll be real still and you will say, Lord, I am ready to hear. When's the last time you said, speak, Lord, your servant hears. I'm listening. I'm listening for you, God. It's so important that our prayers become two-way. Many times when we pray, we can get to the part where we just, all the time, we're doing all the talking. God, I want you to do this, and I need that, and I need a new Cadillac. (laughs) Name it, claim it. But our prayers should also be a time of allowing God to speak to us. Lord, I want you to filter out some of the distractions going on in my life. And there's a lot of distractions in the world today, folks. The devil is in the world, and he is working overtime to draw people away from God. He knows his time is short. I believe that. I believe that we're in the last of the last days. You can see it. And so the enemy knows that he has no choice but to come at us to try to draw us away from God. But we have to say, Lord, take the blinders off. Help me to see Jesus. Help me to see my own heart, to see where I'm at and what I need to do to get back to that place I need to be with you. Sometimes God just wants to bring us back to the place where we started. Back to the place of our first love, Do you remember what it felt like when you first got saved and you realized God knows me? I love that scripture in Job. He knows the way I take. God knows where I'm at, what I'm doing, what's going on in my life. How about this? God cares about what's going on in my life. Sometimes God wants to bring us back to those places, but we can allow so many distractions. And before we know it, we've drifted away from the course. And God is saying to us, it's time to press towards the mark. It's time to get back onto the course. You know, I think about you can be working so hard at doing the wrong things. You read that scripture in Genesis 19 where it's talking about when God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, The men of Sodom were coming and they were beating on the door and the angel came out and smote them with blindness. That's what we're talking about today, how the blindness. The angel smote them with blindness and it says... They wearied themselves to find the door. They were, so, they were trying so hard to find the door. And I think about so many people, they're just not walking in the Spirit. It's time to get back into the Spirit. 
The letter kills, the spirit gives life. You know, when you get up in the morning, it should be, Lord, this is your day. I'm ready to spend some time this morning with you. I'm ready for my spirit to touch your spirit today, God. I want to get closer to you. I hope that's your desire. I hope you were feeling that when you woke up this morning. You said, Lord, I need more. I need more, Lord. I feel where I'm at right now. I'm in a dry place, and I need more. Hey, you can't sail on yesterday's wind. God did great things for you in the past, and that's amazing. But you can't sail on yesterday's wind. You need a fresh wind today. Maybe it's time to lift your sails out and say, God, begin to move me to the place you want me to be. You know, the Scripture says, holy men were moved by the Holy Ghost, when it talks about how the Bible was written. And when you look at that scripture right there, it basically says it's like the, the moving, the wind moved the boat. In the old time, when the wind would move the boat, I want God to move me. Move me, Lord. When I come to church, I want to feel God. I can't go to a church where I don't feel God. Where the preacher gets up there and reads out a Reader's Digest. And if you're lucky, he'll say one or two scriptures. And it's usually not King James. I need more of God. I don't want to be blinded to what's going on in my own heart. Lord, help me to see my heart. You know, it says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God can God can search your heart right now and tell you right where your heart is and what's in your heart. Today, today, if you want to get closer to God, there is nothing stopping you. Spiritual blindness can cause us to dismiss any unwelcome fact or truth that has to adjust the way that we are living. Is it just me or have y'all noticed that most people in the world, they want God to adjust to them? That's the world we're in right now. We need to, God, he's changed over time and and he needs to become more like us. Hey, guess what? God's not changing. God changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not going to change. If anyone needs to change, I'll tell you who needs to change. You ready? You need to be transformed. You need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You need to put on the new garments. Put on the new man. You need to say, Lord, I don't want to be that old person anymore. God, I'm ready to be changed right now, Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, he brought change. And I will tell you this, he does all things well. It is comforting to have a God in your life, watching over you, directing your steps, and bringing about the changes that need to happen in your life. But the only way it's going to happen is when you say, Lord, I surrender all. I give it to you, God. I need you today, Lord. Anybody ready to say that today? I need you, God. I need you, God. God is calling out to us. He's saying, hey, It's time to turn around the direction that you're headed. You know, God loves you so much that sometimes he puts little little roadblocks in your road trying to stop you and to get your attention and say, you're off course. It's time to find your way back to me. Or you can just go like this. I don't want to be blind. Amen. I want to open my eyes to the Lord. Amen. Let me get up to my song here. Right there. See that one? Oh, come on. Let's stand. We'll talk to the Lord right here. We're going to play this song. Take a moment. Let the Lord speak to your heart as this song plays.
Adventurer.